Welcome to the Popish Plot. I'm Nate. And I'm Mike. Today we are going to be talking about penal substitution. <laughs> Mike's laughing because he's he's th- th- there's a little play on words in here. We are discussing penal, that's P-E-N-A-L, substitution, not penile substitution, which is something completely different and will probably never, ever, ever be discussed on this show because if that's a thing, I don't really want to know what it is. <sighs> no, no, neither do I, no, no. Anyways, no, penal substitution is the... Well, I, I'm laughing for two reasons. Okay. One, because it is a it is a pun, and on some level, I'm only as mature as a middle schooler. That's fair. We... But principally, I'm laughing because <clears throat> of how ridiculous a heresy the idea of penal substitution is, and how badly it misunderstands the Lord. Yes. See, for those of you who are not aware of what it is... Penal substitution is the theology that suggests that God, in his nearly infinite wrath, needed something to take his anger out on, and Jesus just happened to be the best choice for him to, to for him to, you know. God is so angry by our sins that he's going to kill something. And he almost doesn't care what it is. Something's going to die just to make him feel better? That part is never really explained. Yeah, just that God's he, really wrathful. He's not love, as the Bible tells us. He's wrath. Yep. It, it, it's, a, it's a theology that's really... It, it's, it's really filled out on the front end, but on the back end it's kind of... It's kind of left wanting. I mean, God is, God is love. It only says it over and over. And <coughs> anyway, so... Why is penal substitution wrong? Well, first off, God is love. Oh, yeah. Almost as if we just said that. I mean, yes, God does demonstrate in the Old Testament periods of wrath. But, but there, but, well, and, you know, there will be a wrathful judgment on all those who refuse to accept his son. Absolutely. That's clear in the New Testament also. But, but. We were discussing what is it or why is it wrong? Either. All right. So, but at the same time, it's mostly wrong because it completely misstates Jesus' role in salvation. So the idea in penal substitution is Jesus as relatively hapless victim. Exactly. Like somebody's going to die and you're the best, some, something's going to die and really you're the best fit for holding all of my infinite wrath. You're the only receptacle deep enough and big yeah. enough to contain all of that anger. I could kill them all and, and I'd still be angry afterwards. But you, I could kill you all I want. And, 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 All that wrath would go away because it would all go into you. And of course, this is inaccurate because Jesus is a victim. Absolutely. He's completely unique in that he is both, he is both the sacrifice and the priest that offers the sacrifice. He's the victim and the one who offers the victim. He's the one who offers the victim. Jesus is not the hapless victim of the father's wrath. Jesus is the willing victim of man's evil and sin. Yep. Jesus saw a solution that could bridge the gap and he volunteered. I mean, we know that he was fully God. So therefore, if he didn't want, if he really, if he really wanted to avoid this at all costs, he could have. But at, the, but at that moment, mm-hmm. right before he is handed over, let your will, not mine, be done. And at every moment that Jesus was on the cross, he could have come down. Yes, he could have done exactly what he could the, have done exactly what the what, what those uh, Roman soldiers said, or, or the Pharisees one. They're taunting him as he's up yeah. there. But we're not just saying this because we're saying this. We have solid scriptural evidence, and we find that way back at the beginning of the Bible, in the famous. Binding of Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. If you would. Well, a lot of people misunderstand this story. Okay. Popular culture and a lot of poorly catechized Christians would have you believe 
that I that Abraham is some wild-eyed old man who is just he's just gonna kill his son. God says I gotta kill my son. I'm gonna, I'm do gonna do it. Kill my son doesn't bother me. And that Isaac is this hapless little boy who couldn't possibly defend himself against his wild-eyed father. But that but that really isn't supported by the story, if I if I recall correctly. Not at all. First, there 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 are several things to consider. Among them. Abraham is 100 years old when Isaac is born. So however old Isaac is at this point in time, Abraham is 100 years older. The second, and this is this is a point you've made quite effectively. Isaac carries the wood. Isaac carries the wood. They, they, they arrive at the mountain with their servants, and Abraham tells the servants, you guys wait here. We're going to go up there. We'll come back down when we're done. Mm -hmm. And then he lays on Isaac the wood for the burnt offering. Yeah, but I mean, come on. It, what, what kid, it, you know, I mean, it's carrying some firewood, right? I mean, it's not just carrying some firewood. Well, first of all, you, we've dealt with children. We know how weak and how whiny they are. Fair enough. So them carrying any wood at all is very difficult. Yeah, but, but when I was like 12, 13, I could carry a... a, a Armload of firewood a little ways. I mean, sure, sure, but that's not enough wood, because what Isaac thinks is going to happen is they're going to offer a lamb as a burnt sacrifice. He he asks his father, "Where's the lamb?" And his father says, "God will provide." Uh, okay, but it's a burnt offering, which means the whole thing is going to get burnt up. Yeah, you're going to need a lot of wood for that. That's a lot of wood. I mean, I mean, this they're not going up there to have a barbecue. They're not looking to come out with some roast with some roast. They're not looking to come back down the mountain with some roast lamb. They're not making s'mores. No, enough wood to burn up the whole thing. Yes, that's a lot of wood. It's a lot of wood. Bodies, even even small lambs, uh, are going to require a lot of heat and a lot of time to really incinerate them. I mean, you you go to a crematorium, and I'm pretty sure they run those things at like thousands of degrees for hours at a time. You're not going to be able to generate those kind of temperatures with wood, so you're going to have to go longer. Yeah. And Isaac carries the wood. Isaac, however old he is, and we don't know his age, and in this translation, he is referred to as a lad, indicating that he's a younger man. But he's strong enough to carry enough wood to completely burn himself up. And his father is whatever age Isaac is, plus, plus 100. 100. So, so reasonably speaking, if he's old enough and strong enough to carry all this wood up the, up the mountain, Isaac can take Abraham. So what you're telling me then is this part here. Um, when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar. I get the feeling like uh, if Isaac is this young strapping man who can carry all this wood and is less than a hundred and is a hundred years younger than the man who's tying him up and laying him on the altar, then in all likelihood, Isaac could have taken him. If Isaac wasn't willing to participate, even if Abraham gets the drop on him and suddenly grabs his arms and holds them behind his back, Isaac is going to be strong enough to break free. Yeah, probably. I mean, he's over a hundred years old. He's and, we've been whining for chapters earlier about well, how old and frail he is. Abraham is not a physical match for Isaac. No, and and, and he was by himself. He he told the servants to stay down there. So not only would he have had to hold the arms behind his back, but he would have also had to tie them up while they're struggling to break free. Which means, in all likelihood, that. Just as Abraham trusted that God would look after his one and only son, whatever may whatever the whatever the outcome of this event may be, discussed extensively in the letter to the Hebrews, that in all that in all honesty and likelihood, Isaac was just as trusting of his father and of God that what was happening was a what needed to happen and B was for the, con the, the good of all. So in the same way, Jesus is not tied up by his father. He's not forced to do something that he's unwilling to do. 
like Isaac, he trusts his father and he lays down his life so that others may live. He, he was almighty God. And if he willed it, he could have changed the way that it went. But that's a whole nother discussion for another video. It absolutely is. So thank you for tuning in for this episode. Uh, make sure you go and hit the subscribe button below and the bell to notify you when other of our Vlent episodes come out. And they're coming fast and thick. Yep, so pay attention. And, and until next time, remember to live your faith. Love your faith. Share, share that, that love. love.